Howdy there folks. The last time we saw certain things going on that I'm about to show you in this video, we got the market to absolutely tank shortly after. Okay. So there's a couple things I want to run you through here, just so you're aware that if the market tanks over the next, um, let's call it one to two months here, you'll just be aware of why it happened essentially. Okay. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple examples of why this did happen in the past. I'm also going to tell you what I'm planning on doing about this whole situation. Do I plan on selling stocks because of this? Do I plan on buying some extra put options? Like, what are my plans here in regards to this whole situation? We're going to talk about Apple earnings, okay? There were some decent things in those Apple earnings. There were some very bad things, okay? And so I want to share that with you. And then obviously a stock that I own, Shopify, um, just completely changed their business model, to be quite frank. And uh, their stock absolutely, obviously, went to the moon here today, even on a down day for the market. So I want to share with you what's going on there and why this is so impactful for them and what it means for the future of that stock price. So busy video. I appreciate everybody. Subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much, folks. And uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, let's get straight into this. Okay, so this is the last four weeks, um, and this shows you the Russell 2000 versus the NASDAQ and versus SP 500. Now, what's interesting is the Russell has severely, I mean, severely underperformed the NASDAQ and the SP 500. Now, that could be blamed on the action in the regional banks here recently and how much weakness there has been. You could blame it on many various things, but nonetheless, this is something we see playing out. Now, why this matters in such a significant, significant way is when we saw this throughout much of the past year and a half or so, something very interesting happened, okay? So let me take you back to November 2021 through November or through December 2021, okay? We had an interesting phenomenon happen where the, the Qs and the SP 500 actually did decent during that time period. And I only kept track of this because I own several different companies that are kind of more like small cap companies, right? Because you know me, I'll own, you know, some super large companies like Tesla and Meta, but also you own some very small cap companies as well. And so I felt this and I was feeling a lot of pain in the market at the end of 21 while no one else was really feeling it. And we saw this kind of massive divergence here between the Russell and the other indexes. Well, what happened shortly after that? Oh my gosh, okay. Well, shortly after that, the indexes fell in a quite a substantial way. The next one and a half months, this is what happened. S&P 500 fell 10% plus. The Russell obviously fell 12% plus, And then the NASDAQ fell almost 16% just after you saw this massive divergence between the Russell 2000 and what was going on in the other indexes as well, okay? That's not the only time. We saw it again just a few months later. This is mid-March 2022 through the first week of April of 2022. Well, so, you know, roughly around the same time, time period we're in right now. The Russell was underperforming and underperforming quite significantly. The market was actually on an uptrend, but yet the, the Russell couldn't even do close to as good as the S&P 500 could do, or certainly in the NASDAQ. I mean, look at the, the divergence between the Qs and with the Russell. I mean, the Russell's 3%, Qs are 11%. It's an insane divergence. And what happened right after that? Well, from the beginning of April through the second week of May, the market tanked in an absolutely epic way. S&P 500 went down about 15%. Obviously, the Russell fell even, you know, a, a dramatic amount more, right? And the Qs led everybody down even lower to 21%. And so there's several different time periods in the last 18 months. You can go back and you can see, essentially, the Russell basically kind of leading you to like, hey, you know, this market's about to tank here, essentially, okay? So this is no foolproof plan. This is no 100% guarantee that the market's going to tank over the next one to two months or anything like that. But we've definitely seen this correlation play out several different time periods um, over, let's just call it the past year, year and a half, something like that, okay? Now, that's not the only thing we have going here. Something else is going on, okay? The VIX is spiking huge all of a sudden, okay? We, the VIX has, this is just on the past five days. In the past five days, the VIX has spiked about 20%. The VIX has been dormant for a while now, to be honest, and just on a big kind of downtrend. And so to see volatility start to pick up, you haven't even really seen it hit the indexes that heavy yet, okay? So to see the VIX spiking up like this, it seems like it's getting ready for something potentially big to happen in the market here, okay? And so these are things that I think are worth paying attention to because when you usually see the VIX start to spike huge, shortly after that, you get a massive move down in the indexes and you get the VIX to spike even to a higher extent, right? A 20% move in five days, even with the indexes making, let's say only a 1% move or so, that's pretty extraordinary. It seems like there's there's something brewing here on, on potentially a big move here, okay? And usually it's a big move to the downside when you see the VIX spike like that, okay? 
Now, you might ask me, okay, you see a couple of these trends going on. Like, why not just sell everything right now, buy back in one or three months? Okay, let's assume this Russell's leading us to what the conclusion could be of the market. You know, we also are now in May, so it could be a, a you know, sell in May and go away where you, we actually get a decent amount of selling pressure in the market in the back half of May, right? Why not go ahead and sell out of everything, buy back in one or three months from now or something like that, okay? Well, so the first component of that is, why wouldn't I do something like that? Okay. One is taxes. Okay. Secondly, timing the market. It's really, really hard to do. Cause if you get out, you know, who's to say you're going to get back in at better prices. When do you get back in? I think that's really, really tough, tough decisions overall. And so, you know, when you think about it from that context, the third context is think about it like this. Who's to say that's going to even happen? So we got the VIX spiking up 20% five days, and we got the Russell leading us to a possibility that, you know, we could see a big tank coming in the SP500 and the NASDAQ. But it doesn't mean if it's a for sure. It's not a foolproof plan, right? It's not like this is a for sure thing. So to then make a judgment and say, oh, because I'm seeing this, I have to sell out my portfolio, I think it's just a little misguided. So what something like somebody like myself, I'm going to look at this, I'm going to be aware of this, and what I'm going to go ahead and do is put together my buy list of stocks that I'm keeping a very close eye on and if the market drops in any meaningful way i'm ready to buy those stocks okay you got to always have your buy list ready i have a second quarter of this year buy list and these are stocks i'm picking off left and right as they come into prices and i have specific prices i want to buy them at and if it goes to this price i'm going to buy even heavier and, and this and that okay and so this is something all of us as investors need to do out there in the market you always got to have more income than expenses have some money on the sideline and if we get some big tank in the market okay you have your opportunities ready. You have it all ready to rock and roll just in case it happens, okay? You don't have to worry about selling your entire portfolio. You don't have to, I mean, if you want to hedge and you want to buy some puts, you can certainly do that, right? I, I'm hedged in the market. I own a bunch of SDAO call options. So in case the Dow tanks in any significant way, obviously those will print money. I own a few other put options out there in the market. So I'm hedged just in case the stuff hits a fan and just in case this market tanks 10, 20% over this next one to three months, I'll, I'll be able to capitalize on that obviously and then put that money into long positions. But for hedging, you know, you don't really have to do that unless you're a very sophisticated investor, unless you have tons of money in the market, right? And I put together a super in-depth, very long video in the private group here recently about all different hedging strategies that you can Im implement. And there's a ton of them out there, but you don't have to do that. If you've got 10K in the market, you don't have to hedge your portfolio like, you know, a hedge fund manager or somebody that's got millions of dollars in the market or something like that, okay? That's just different strategies. So what for most folks is it's like, get your buy list together, get your specific prices you want to buy and, and get those ready to rock and roll because there's a, a potential here. We could see a, a move down. It's just important. You kind of understand why that could happen and what's kind of transpiring here. Okay. Next up here, let's talk about Apple. Let's talk about Shopify and a few other subjects here that are interesting. Okay. So with Apple, this was very intriguing. Okay. So first thing to keep in mind is there's a few extra days. It looks like in this quarter. So do keep that in mind, but revenue is down for the company. Okay. They came in at about $74 billion of revenue for products, uh, 77.4 billion. So basically their business is deteriorating. It is getting worse. That is a sign in my opinion, not of like Apple's a bad company or something like that. I don't think magically Apple became a bad company. I just think this is a sign of the overall weakness in the macroeconomic landscape. Okay. I think this is something the Fed should be looking at and seeing like, wow, Apple's actually got it several quarters now of declining revenue and they're expected to have declining revenue next quarter as well. When a company like Apple has seen their business go down, it definitely should tell you something. Okay. And wait till I show you the America's numbers. Those will shock you. Okay. Services revenue was up nicely in the quarter. Uh, you know, they always are, seem to be going up on iCloud and Apple Music and all these different things. And so they just collect more and more money through services, but not as impressive as a number as you might want to see. I think it was a five percentage number. So total, total sales, obviously not what you want to see from Apple down, you know, two and a half billion dollars or so there. As far as products revenue down quite substantially services revenue, you know, it's, this is cost of sales here. Okay. The reason I have this red as far as cost of sales for products is this number didn't go down as much as you'd want to see considering how much product was down there. You'd want to see, you know, even, even to a, a greater extent. Now, in terms of services, I think that's fine. That's in line. I mean, look at how much they grew. They grew by over a billion dollars, but they didn't grow by over a billion dollars or even close to that in terms of services, in terms of cost of sales. So I, I thought that was impressive. Total cost of sales, 
you know, it, it's decent. Oh, it's decent. I'll give them that. Gross margin, obviously declining. You don't want to ever see that in a company. Research and development, they're spending over a billion dollars more this year in the same exact quarter than last year, which is over $300 million a month more, right? I gave them a blue for that kind of being indifferent because obviously Apple has to continue to spend on R&D. Selling general administrative is actually really impressive. They kept that kind of in line with last year. Very impressed, okay? Total operating expenses, I give them a blue there, right? Because it's mostly R&D. Operating income, obviously down uh, year over year by about $1.5, $1.6 billion there. Not something you want to see. Net income down by almost a billion dollars. EPS roughly in line with last year. I thought that was really impressive, okay? Now, let me show you how bad things really are in the United States of America right now for Apple. It's really bad, okay? This is the Americas region this year versus last year, okay? They're down over $3 billion of revenue in the Americas region versus the same quarter last year, okay? This is ultimately their really bad market. It's not the only troubling thing. No, the amazing thing is somehow Apple eked out growth in Europe, which Europe has been arguably hit even harder by inflation than we have in, uh, obviously, the America. So that was actually, I was impressed with that. That's why I gave them a green for Europe. Now, China. China down $500 million roughly in revenue in greater China. Now, the reason that's so significant is what have we heard? Oh, it's the China reopening. You know, businesses are going to be doing so amazing in China again, this and that, right? And a lot of people were drawn to these conclusions about like Apple was going to be super strong with China reopening. But if anything, we're seeing, you know, if people, one, I'm hearing the economy is not strong in China. That's complete BS, okay? Second component I'm hearing is if people do have money in China, they're going and spending their, their money now on like experiences, right? It's the reopening, so they want to go travel. Macau's numbers are starting to get boosted up in a major way, right? Um, you know, some, some are definitely coming out to Vegas. And so, like, people are going on trips, going different places, and it's doing more experiential stuff rather than I got to buy the newest iPhone or I got to go buy a new MacBook or something like that when everybody was in lockdowns, okay? So, nonetheless, everybody that was all hyped about, you know, oh, yeah, China's reopening. It's going to be so great for Apple. It, it doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it at all. Japan was also down quite significantly, down almost $600 million year over year for Japan. That was interesting. Rest of Asia Pacific, really strong for Apple here at over a billion dollar gain there. So that's a, that's the one I'll give them a really good, nice uh, green one on there. Okay. Now, iPhone, this is a miracle. Miracle. It's a miracle. Apple grew this business the iPhone business year over year. They grew at almost a billion dollars. That's incredible. Good for Apple. And obviously, I'm sure much of it came from rest of Asia Pacific. But dang, that's impressive, man. Super impressive. I mean, there's really there's really no hype around the iPhone 14. And with the current macroeconomic landscape the way it is, I thought that was actually impressive. I'm amazed. I'm amazed they grew iPhone revenue year over year. The Mac business is a complete disaster zone right now, right? $7.1 billion it did in Mac business versus 10.4 in the same quarter last year. Disaster. iPad business is a disaster right now, down about a billion dollars year over year on the same quarter, right? And wearables home, I gave them a red for that because I think that should be growing right now. Considering I, I thought their Apple Watch should have been a really strong kind of boost for them there. So services, obviously give them a green there. They continue to grow that services revenue that continues to kind of be the protection on Apple's business model overall, right? Now I listened to the entire conference call live. Cook and Luca, oh my gosh, okay. You know, Cook and the CFO there, those guys are the biggest uh, sneaky pumpers of that stock, okay? That's all I'm gonna say about that, okay? So listen, you know, people say Elon Musk is a pumper, okay? On conference calls, I'm telling you, Cook, in, in, in the CFO there, man, those guys avoided questions like the plague around guidance, in my opinion. They avoided questions like the plague, man. And they were hit with so many softball questions. I was just like, holy smokes, man, does, does Cook have these guys and gals on payroll? Like, my gosh, these questions are so softball. I was like, this is, this is almost comical. And they shot down so many times, like questions around guidance and whatnot. And, um, it didn't sound like they were very comfortable in talking anything about the future of the business in terms of when I'm talking about the future of the business, I'm talking about from like number standpoint, you know, it's kind of like, Oh, India. I mean, gosh, if I had a dollar for every time they talk about India on the conference call, Holy smokes. Okay. They even talked about AI on the conference call. That's the, the popular thing everybody's talking about. Right. And so I just thought the conference call was almost more comical than anything. And also cooks, Ah, never mind. I don't even want to talk about that. Okay. So now the interesting thing is, so they, 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 they wouldn't give a specific number. This was so lame in my opinion. 
they wouldn't give a specific number for what they're expecting revenue. So rather than saying we're going to expect, you know, 80 billion to 82 billion dollars in revenue for 2023, rather than say that, they said it in this like confusion way of like trying to relate it to the last quarter but looking at a year over year basis. So to to cut through all the crap for you guys, what it sounds like to me is it sounds like to me basically they're expecting revenue to be down about 2% for the quarter. That's what I got from it, okay? They never said a specific number. Why didn't they say a specific number? I'll tell you why. Because they don't want, they know if they come out and let's say they, they guide for 80 to $82 billion of revenue or 81 to 83 or something like that, right? You know what's gonna happen? That's gonna hit the algos and the algos are gonna say, Apple just missed uh, the revenue guide. Sell, sell, sell. And instead of that stock being up 2% after hours, it probably would have been down five to 7% after hours. That's how you do it, okay? And so they snuck that in there. It's not like it's an illegal move. It's perfectly fine. They can do that. It's just, in my opinion, it was just like one of those where I'm just like, seriously, like, it's ridiculous, okay? So this matters a significant way because if it's a negative 2% number that I thought that it was from the conference call, which I believe it is, um, then basically that means there's about a four percentage point difference because analysts had them growing 2% for this upcoming quarter. So if the company's expecting negative 2%, Mm, that's a several billion dollars of, of missing money there, okay? So it does matter in a pretty significant way for Apple overall, okay? Now, so in, in regards to Apple, I think, I, you know, I was impressed by the numbers for this past quarter. I was not impressed by the conference call. Not impressed by the conference call, okay? That's all I'll say about that. And, and I, I just don't understand why it seems like to me that Cook is like, has to it seems like he feels like the, the stock price always has to be at a certain price or something like that. It's very strange. That's how it comes across to me, at least. I'm like, you know, especially with their big share buyback, I'm like, don't be afraid to drop that thing a little bit. Come in, just say the guidance. If you think it's going to be $82 billion, $81 billion, and, and the owl goes pick up on that, who cares? Oh, well, they picked up on it. Like, you know what I mean? That just cracks me up, but it is what it is. So that, that's that whole situation, right? Shopify. So Shopify just changed their entire business model and in a pretty significant way. And the stock shot up massively today. It was up 20 plus percent. I think I saw at one point it was up as much as 27% today. Crazy big day for Shopify. It's now my third best performing stock in the Patreon portfolio. Okay. By the way, if you want to join uh, the, my Patreon, that's going to be pinned comment down there. You get access to see all the moves I'm making in this portfolio, which I'm making moves in there tomorrow morning um, in terms of stocks I'm buying, selling. You also get to be part of the Discord chat as well. That'll be pinned comment down there if you're looking to access that, see how I build out a portfolio. But this is now my third best performing stock. So this is huge, okay? So Shopify announced Thursday that it's going to cut 20% of its staff and it's selling off its logistics business. So this is a game changer for the company, okay? This isn't a small thing. This is a, a massive move for the company. Shopify is selling Deliver, which it acquired in 2022 for $2.1 billion in any progress it made on Shopify operated warehouses for a well, it's said to be a 13% equity stake in Flexport on top of its existing equi uh, equity from previous investments. So Jeff, the CFO, said Shopify's a stake in Flexport is now in the high teens, so I don't know, 18, 19%, something like that, on co the company's uh, call, right? Now, also, they sold this Six, Six River Systems, a warehouse automation and robotics company that they purchased in 2019. They sold it for, uh, looks like, another undisclosed sum. So uh, let's call it another big amount of money, okay? And so this is interesting now because this makes Shopify now back into an asset like business model, which is, I can tell you, between the 20% cut in employees and selling off these businesses, I think you're going to see Shopify's margins and Shopify's operating income and Shopify's net income go to the moon the next 12 to 18 months. And I'm talking about, it's gonna be extraordinary because I can tell you this logistics side of their business and this building out, this infrastructure and whatnot, and all these extra employees that it took, so costly, it's not even funny. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars of cost for the company. And so with them changing this, it's completely changed Shopify's business model, not just for the short term, but for the long term as well. Back into an asset like business model, which is what everybody always wanted Shopify to just stay like. They didn't want Shopify to be Amazon. Shopify, you know, Amazon's a very asset heavy business model, right? Warehouses, planes, all the trucks that are going around your neighborhood all the time, all this stuff owned by Amazon, right? 
asset heavy, super asset heavy, right? AWS having all that cloud infrastructure, that's Amazon, right? And that's fine for Amazon, it's fine for Amazon shareholders like me that are buying that stock very heavy and we're happy that it's like that. But Shopify, investors and potential investors don't want to see it be Amazon. They want this to be an asset late business model that it's not going to have as big of a revenue number, but it's going to be extraordinarily profitable. Like a type of company that you can see 30% of its revenue hitting down to the net income line. 35%, those sorts of numbers, almost like, you know, the greatest SaaS companies in the world, those sorts of numbers, 20, 30, 35%, you know, net income margins, like incredible numbers. And that's where Shopify can be. And it seems like where that's where Toby's leading this company is back to that asset light business model. And so this is ultimately a game changer for Shopify. And I wouldn't be surprised if this stock continues to perform great over the next 12 months, despite whatever goes on in the market whatever goes on, 10, 20%, 30% drop, I don't think it even matters. I think regardless of the market conditions, I think Shopify is going to see a massive influx of investors piling into that stock because that just completely changed their business model, completely changed what the margin structure will be and completely changed what their net income will be in a massive epic way, okay? Now, they're also going to have this nearly, let's say 18, 19, 17, whatever percent stake that ultimately whatever that becomes over time, which that's their official partner, they can help that grow over time in that equity position could be worth a lot more in future years, right? And they should have a nice close connection with them since they have such a big ownership. I mean, if you're talking about nearly a 20% ownership stake in this Flexport company, that matters, right? And so they should have a very good relationship there. So, you know, I'll say this, folks, um, don't be surprised if Shopify is one of the best performing stocks in the entire stock market the next 12 to 18 months. Do not be surprised, okay? Now, Earnings season. So we've gotten through pretty much all the big earnings. Uh, I think there's only NVIDIA's the only big, big dog left. I got several of my companies still reporting over the next few weeks. I got to say this about earnings season. You know, I, I, if I was a bear, I wouldn't be super happy with these earnings seasons because most of these companies have either slightly beaten or slightly missed. We've had a few massive beats. I have seen a few of those, but I can tell you, I haven't seen many massive misses. If I have seen misses, they've been small misses. But I've seen a lot more, I'd say, small beats than small misses. And so ultimately, I think earnings season has held up better than feared. And that's from the bullish side and the bearish side. So that's kind of my perspective on that. Obviously, a lot of the mids and smalls will be reporting over the next two to three weeks. So uh, yeah, a lot going on here, okay? Appreciate everybody joining me as always. If you want to access my Patreon and join us in there, see the moves I'm up to in the market and join our, our, after, our, our market hours Discord chat and all that good stuff, check out the pinned comment down there. It's a no-brainer to get in there. And I think we got 58 members now in there. Hey, man, you could be in the, the top, the first hundred here, baby. You got to get in there. Okay, much love. Appreciate y'all and have a great day.